So, in order to create a robot that has the capability to aid the crew in the, which, the ways that I've suggested, we first went after creating a system that moved like the crew, had the same speeds, the same joint motions. If you want to create a robot that interacts with the crew with the same tools and the same workspaces and the same hardware, in the end, you're going to design a system that looks very similar to a person. And so you're going to have a, you know, an anthropomorphic system that looks uh, you know, much like a person. So, so we see this technology with, with trying to create uh, you know, a robot or a system that uh, moves kinematically and at the same velocity, has some of the same strength endurance, uh, or actually exceeds uh, the strength endurance of a human. And so here, I'll, we'll show you a little demonstration of, of you know, uh, rubber, showing a robot that has that kind of capability. And all this goes to telling a very intricate story, which is, in the end, like I said earlier, you want to create a robot or a robot system that works well with people. Well, along the way, you need certain building blocks. And like I said, creating a system that has a similar speeds uh, was the first part of that building block. We have a little fun with the robot. But, uh, so this kind of gives you an idea of the kind of... Actually, we took out most of the matrix sequence because uh, <laughs> management didn't like it. But, uh, <laughs> but we kind of pared it down, and you know, at two in the morning, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, but this kind of shows you what kind of workspace the robot encompasses. You know, it's a very similar workspace that you and I have. Um, again, we felt that was very important. Uh, so the motions, the inherent motions, the intrinsic motion that the robot's able to produce matches that of a human quite nice. It has, actually has a lot more range of motion than a human does. For example, I can't turn my wrist 360 degrees, but it can. I can't turn my neck all the way around. I probably could, but you know, <laughs> would, they had to replace me soon after that. But this robot can. Um, but another key ingredient to creating this human robotic partnership uh, to be, uh, that will be successful is you need a certain amount of dexterity. And so we really went after the uh, we really went after the hand design on this robot. What separates this robot among a lot of other robots for this particular class is the amount of uh, motion, the amount of dexterous motion, the amount of the amount of range of motion that our fingers has, the ability to manipulate those objects, and the kind of grasp forces that we can create on those objects. And so that really is a key discriminator that you don't necessarily see in other robots of this similar weight class. And that weight class is very important. Like I said, we wanted to create a robot that had a similar size and shape as, uh, as a human. It's a little on the larger side. Um, the biceps are smaller than the, uh, the largest recorded size that Arnold gave when he was winning Mr. <laughs> Universe. And it has the, uh, the wingspan that's less than Yao Ming. So it falls within human data, albeit on the larger <laughs> side of human data. <laughs> But so, like I said, we've built up this range of motion story. We've got this, uh, this dexterity motion. So then we have to tackle what's, what's, what those key ingredients are to working close and safe with people. And so this manipulator is very different from a lot of other uh, robots that you might come in contact with. It's not a positionally controlled manipulator. In industrial robotic systems, like painting robots, welding robots, uh, general assembly robots for manufacturing line, pick and place machines, they're very highly precise positioning devices. But, but what comes with that is this uh, inability to control contact dynamics or contact forces uh, really well. And so what we have done is we've created a really soft and loose system. So this, this, uh, this robot has intrinsic force sensing that's also a <coughs> compliant member or a member that flexes around a lot that we measure the torques and the forces that it creates. So what that allows us to do, it allows us to uh, act like more of what a human does. So I'm a real floppy uh, system, but I can also be a real stiff system at the same time. So we can vary, we can vary that stiffness um, in, the, in this robot just the same way that a human does. And this is very important for doing real work because when you do an activity, you at times are stiff and you at times are, are loose depending on what you're doing. And so if I come out here, the palm has a, and you can see it kind of rebounding, uh, like the spring motion, and uh, 
So it has a certain stiffness to it, but I can vary that stiffness in uh, 3D space. I can also vary what part of the robot manipulator I choose to be how stiff. For example, the elbow isn't nearly as stiff as the palm is. And so when I am doing assembly activities or construction activities, this is a very key feature to doing work really well. So positional robots don't do the round peg and the round hole uh, trick well because if they're off ever so slightly, they build up gigantic contact forces. So what this allows us to do is using this type of technology is to feel that peg into the hole. And actually, it kind of, it's a little counterintuitive, but you actually get the task done a lot quicker, more successfully, and a lot safer. So you can, it's okay. so you can feel, feel the rebound. Just push, push right on the palm here. And you can feel, you can, you, yeah, pull it towards you. You can feel how hard it is to pull towards you. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, and, then pull, and then pull on the elbow here. And you can feel that it's fundamentally, uh, it's fun, yeah, go ahead and pull it out. So you can feel that it's not nearly as stiff as the palm is. Right. Now we'll stiffen that up. And you can see that now it's a lot harder to pull out. Oh, yeah. So there you go. Okay. So those, that type of technology also allows us to create uh, another important building block with humans and robots, which is safety, of course. And so I can give you this presentation. And if this was a big factory robot that had a big painting device that was going to paint a car frame on down the line, you would see a gigantic light curtain. You would see, you know, a cage that they wouldn't let you anywhere near. That, a, you know, if you if you were an intruder into that cage, a big steel frame would come down. You'd be put in handcuffs because you'd be worried about getting killed. And I'm going to stand out of this way because the the, uh, the speed of the arms fill up pretty quick, right? And these are these are 50. These are 50 pound arms, and if I got hit with that, it would some significant velocity. If I was up against, if I was up against a, a hard object, it's going to hurt. You know, it could theoretically break the bone. It could. Uh, yeah. so now, having saw that, I'm going to stand right here, continue giving the presentation, and what you're going to see is I can stop the action of the manipulator just effortlessly. You know, and so. That allows us to interact with the robot shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow, while we're doing our assembly tasks and not have too much concern about the robot bumping into us. You know, when you're working next to someone, it is commonplace to bump into that person because you know, we're big compliant floppy systems and you don't worry about breaking your elbow by accidentally touching someone, right? Well we need to we need to keep those, we need to keep that same sort of idea as we build robots that interact with people. And so this is a, uh, that type of technology and that type of safety is, is absolutely imperative in moving forward to creating these systems that are viable for, for human robotic partnerships. What you do with all that is you do work. And so that's another very key difference that discriminates this robot from some other robots that you might see uh, out in the, uh, out, out in the, you know, the, on YouTube, um, doing fancy dance moves and, and playing trumpets and violins and conducting symphonies and whatnot. This robot was designed from the ground up to manipulate the objects. And, and in particular, what uh, robots haven't done well uh, previously is manipulate objects that aren't spatially deterministic. Um, when, you have a, when you have a blanket, for example, or a mylar fabric or a cloth or something that's covering, uh, that's covering something you'd like to get to, you first have to remove it. And that's actually a big problem on the space station right now is a lot of these orbital replacement units. Uh, in fact, even the robotic replaceable units are covered with a fabric first that has to be removed before that the robot can replace the item. And so it would have been better, in my opinion, to create a robot that had the capability uh, to remove the fabric to begin with. And so um, we'll demonstrate that to you here. But again, blankets are bad because you just don't, you know, it's not a rigid object. And so you don't have, uh, it's, not easily, it's not easily understood as to where the object is going to uh, be in space. So there's an envelope under it. So not only is a, a blanket a floppy object, but, but so is an envelope. <laughs> and another important uh, aspect is being able to use the robot 
and use the sensors that are available to it. So this robot right now is, is uh, performing some machine algorithms on this envelope, waiting for me to take it from it. So you have to embed a certain amount of intelligence into the, into the robot system in order for it to be a usable product. Right? So you're going to see payloads on the single, uh, single kilogram uh, level, you know, one or, two, one or two kilos. And what we're able to do, actually, I'd like my lovely assistant to come out here <laughs> with the weight. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> He's actually a volunteer. Yeah. Or we could use a volunteer. Okay, that's so, uh, so, pound for pound, this robot doesn't have as much strength capability as a human being. Uh, muscles are very well engineered devices for how much they weigh, and uh, we're gonna, it's going to be a while until we have uh, actuation devices that rival the strength of a human. However, one advantage that we have over humans is we have an endurance level, or robots have an endurance level that far exceeds uh, that far exceeds humans. And I'll attempt to demonstrate a little bit of that. <laughs> so we're going to do a weightlifting demo. This is 20 pounds. And uh, we're going to show you that the robot's able to manipulate it around with relative ease. But we're also going to put it in configurations that everyone knows and while you're watching this are going to be rather painful. And so, <laughs> And so that'll kind of highlight the, uh, the idea that I'm trying to express. So that, that hand in particular is, is, a, is, a, is a hand that can manipulate a blanket, it can handle an envelope, and it can also hold 20 pound weight. And so this part's pretty easy, right? I mean, it's just standard. You just get in the gym, you pick up your, your pick up your dumbbells, you start doing some curls, right? You kind of feel it burn a little bit, but you're still feeling pretty good about yourself. And then you see, like, you know, this, this cute person across the way. You want to start showing off a little bit. <laughs> and so you. Uh, <laughs> So Adam, Adam's a pretty big guy, right? <laughs> and so Adam's a pretty big guy, and he, he can manipulate the weight fine, but when we pause for dramatic effect, <laughs> it becomes very painful for Adam to keep going. And I won't kill him, so, so let's keep going before, Adam, before we take him to the hospital with a hernia. And uh, just to show you that, yes, we don't have actuators that can lift as much as Adam can for how much Adam weighs, but without any effort, we can exceed his endurance level. And that's a very important point, is that robots tend to do things really, really well. That we In the end, we've got to create devices that are, that are pleasant to be around and that, that are friendly for people to interact with. And so I'm going to give the robot a handshake because it did a really good job today. But actually, I'll introduce this. Uh, again, this, this, this handshake also highlights a few of the other technologies that I was speaking about earlier. Um, it has, the robot's going to sense the force of me gripping the hand, and when I start, when I initiate a handshake, just kind of when you walk up to someone you initiate a handshake, somebody starts pumping from it, right? And so you kind of get this leader follower action that kind of, kind of starts, and so, <laughs> and uh, it's a hand, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that again, that, 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 te that technology, that intrinsic technology that allows it to kind of feel, you know, that allows it to kind of understand the forces that are being imparted on the forces that are being imparted on the environment is the, is the core of the system.